Welcome to the PLC Professors Workshop. This is going to be the first of many discussions about a project. This will be the first time I've done this type of a uh, series of recordings where I start at the beginning of a project, an actual engineering project. This is a project that I'm currently working on and it's almost done. It'll be done in another month commissioned up and running. And this particular project involves enough different components, skills, and disciplines that we can that we can get quite a few recordings out of. And I will tell you right up front, if you're looking for entertainment, this won't be entertainment. If you're looking to get a better grip on how to do a project, a controls engineering project, uh, this is probably a good video to watch. Now this first video may not have any technical details that you're looking for because we're going to do a lineup. So what I'm attempting to do is start at the very beginning and discuss the project. Normally when you do a project you're either doing it for the company you work for or you're contracting. This is a project that I contracted to do. And I've been doing contract engineering for uh, more than 10 years. My primary drive is knowledge transfer. I just love doing training. And I do a lot of on-site training at customer sites, Harley-Davidson, Blue Apron, Pennsylvania Gathering, that's a um, natural gas gathering system and the control logics ran giant compressors that compress natural gas into liquid. So I, I did a couple weeks training there, 500 and 5,000. So I do a lot of on-site training, but I like to interleave it with actual projects. Now I do projects right here in this shop in the past, they would have all been for me or for something I was building for a customer. Now, because of the remote nature of this business, I'm actually doing an engineering project sitting right here in my workshop. Now, I'm in a 20 foot by 20 foot room. So I have 400 square feet here, and this is this little studio is in the corner. What you can't see are the power tools and all the equipment and inventory on shelves, work tables, etc. So I'm going to start right at the beginning and the first thing I'm going to do is give you the lineup for the project. Let's go look at some of that information right now. This project is a assembly cell and this assembly cell has three SCARA type robots that work around a rotary index. And if you're not familiar with the rotary index, we did cover one of those in one of the manuals. It's uh, basically a round plate that could be anywhere from 12 inches in diameter to 12 feet. And all around the edge, there are nests. A nest would be a machined block or a fixture that a part sets in. And as the table indexes, let's say it has 12 positions. So every time it indexes, it indexes 1 12th of 360 degrees, basically 30 degrees. And so every 30 degrees along the edge of this rotating disc, 12 inches to 12 feet in diameter, are going to be fixturing or machines or processes that will do an operation on the part as the part comes in front of it. In this particular assembly cell, there is a rotary index. It's not very big. It's probably 18 inches and it has 12 nests. In other words, 12 locations. They are there for two different products. It's actually going to move 60 degrees on each index. And then if you're running a different product, you will offset by 30 and then index by 60 you might as well say six positions, six nests. And in each of the nests, some different function will occur on the part. We have three robots that are doing something to parts in those nests. For an HMI, we have a panel view plus, a seven inch. I prefer 10 inch and larger. One thing I want to mention about this project, which is important, 
almost no project comes clean. There's always things missing. All the information won't be there. It's just the nature of the business. This one, somebody else had already started, so they had already specified certain components. Some of them I returned to the vendor and ordered what I wanted. The first one happened to be a Compact Logix L27 ERM. Originally, they had ordered a Micro 850. There are features that the Micro 800 family does not have that I wanted for this project. I sent that back and got a Compact Logix L27 ERM. That was one thing I changed, but the three robots were already a done deal. The Panel View Plus, they had picked a 7 inch. I added the 1732 armor block. The project already had two stepper motors. And the stepper motors, one of them was a combo controller driver motor, but its interface was RS-232. And the other one uh, did not have an interface. It was just a stepper motor, just a plain stepper motor, NEMA 34. I specified different stepper motors, and I'll explain the differences. I specified a 440C CR30 programmable safety relay. That's basically a micro 8 30 in red plastic and then for the conveyor I specified a PowerFlex 525. This is the basic hardware that we're going to be working with. I may add some things as I go here. I may have forgot to put something in the list. However, keep in mind that this project was already started when I got it and there is less done on it than what I thought was already done. In this business there's this difference in perception that you're always going to have to deal with. There's a customer who the machine is getting built for. There is a project manager who's managing the project, managing the mechanical, delivery, programming, design, every all the details. And then there's you or the engineers. There's usually at least two engineers, a mechanical and an electrical. Switching back to the camera for a minute, I said that there is usually two engineers, a mechanical and electrical. There might actually be three or four engineers. Uh, sometimes they split up the mechanical into the fixtures, meaning all of the machine parts and the flow of the machine. So there might be three mechanical engineers, someone that does the overall mechanical design, you know, the layout of the machine. And then they uh, sketch up components and they put them off to detailers who actually detail out each of the pieces and components. And then there may also be a hydraulics or pneumatics person who does all the cylinders, whether hydraulic or pneumatic. And then on the electrical end, someone has to design the system and then somebody has to program it. And sometimes the Whereas the electrical design is normally done by one person, uh, the programming could actually be done by two or more. You could have someone that's doing the PLC, someone that's doing the HMI, and someone that is doing the robots. Because someone has to program the robots. And it could even be a fourth. At a minimum, you're going to have two, one mechanical, one electrical. I don't think I've ever met anyone that was able to do all the mechanical and all the electrical. Because the electrical, not only are you designing a circuit, but you're also doing a panel layout. So you have to be cognizant of the what power is available and the distribution of that power, cabling, all kinds of stuff. So sometimes there's more than two engineers, but there's at least two. Now in this case, uh, I was not going to be doing the electrical, just the program, and then I ended up also getting the electrical to do, which is fine. Haven't done it in a while, but I enjoy it. And then I wasn't going to do the robot programming. Then I was, but uh, the timelines probably won't tolerate it, so we'll have to have another person because you can only do so much. You can't do two things at the same time. So these are, uh, I'm sharing with you a lot of the facets of a project that you might not ordinarily consider. So I'm trying to share the whole thing with you and give you the benefit of my experience. And if uh, you find some of this boring, just fast forward through it until you see something interesting and then continue. But keep in mind 
I'm going to be sharing a lot of information over many recordings, all to do with this one project. So you got these four different parties, and every one of us, them, has a different idea of what the other three are doing or have completed, because we tend to allow the impression that we have more done than we actually have on paper. That's important to say, on paper, because you can have it done in your head, but it's not on paper. Just like this project, I'm sure that the previous electrical engineer had quite a bit done in their head, but it wasn't on paper. So it wasn't transferable over to the next person. So they didn't do anything wrong. They might have even done a better job of their first 40 hours than I did. But there's always going to be this difference in perception. And the least involved people and the technical details, like the project manager and the customer, they don't expect it to take as long as it's going to take. It always takes longer and costs more than what people expect. That's just a fact. So you're always going to have to deal with that. So if you're thin-skinned, you better get over it. Learn how to take on these things without getting emotional. Because if you get emotional, you lose. On this particular project, my impression of what was done and the manager's impression of what was done was different than what was actually on paper. So there's a lot of misconception on what you're doing and what's been done when you start a project where you weren't there on day one. So just be aware that a lot of projects you will inherit. You won't be there when they did the first lineup. If you don't use a spreadsheet, the nice thing about spreadsheet is that you can organize your thoughts into sheets. And it's real easy to edit. It's real easy to link things. You can kind of make some of your data omnipotent in the sense that if you change it on one sheet, it changes it on another sheet. If you're using formulas and you change a variable on one sheet, it changes the results on the other sheet. But primarily, I use it to chart out my sequences and my data flow. Uh, There's other software you can do that with, but a spreadsheet's a good thing to do it with. Another thing is CAD work. Now, I didn't put this in the list. I have hundreds, if not thousands, of hours using AutoCAD. and I mean, starting way back in the beginning when it was like version 2. Don't remember the date, but back then AutoCAD wasn't better than anything else. It was just another newbie CAD package. And I started using it, and I used it for quite a few years up to about release 14. But then I didn't use it from release 14, and that would have been probably 15 years ago. I went without doing CAD work for quite a few years. Originally, I was just going to do the PLC programming and the HMI, and that was it. At some point in the project, I was asked if I would assume a leadership role in the electrical design. I started relearning AutoCAD, and I didn't like what I found. Remember, I had not used AutoCAD since release 14, 15 years ago. Finally, I realized that AutoCAD, in order to encompass all these different disciplines in the one CAD package, front end of it has some things that I didn't need. So I started looking around at other CAD packages, plus AutoCAD is expensive. And after trying a number of them, I ended up with SkyCAD, which you're seeing on the screen in front of you. It's real easy to use. It is fully automated. If you're going to do the electrical design, you got to put it on paper. You know, if it's in your head, that's not worth anything. It has to be handed off to other people. These are the major pieces of hardware that we're going to use in this project. So let's move on and discuss some of these individual pieces of hardware. The first one is the controller, Compact Logics. Originally, it was going to be a Micro 800. This particular device is a controller. It's a processor, an L27 ERM, which means it has redundant Ethernet, and it supports motion, meaning servo axes. But it has embedded 16 in, 16 out, 4 analog in, 2 analog out, and then a high-speed counter. It requires 24 volts DC, L27 ERM, and this will give you kind of a light view into the programming. We will discuss this uh, project tree and structure in more depth later on as we go, but I just wanted to give you a brief glimpse ahead 
to give you some idea that we will uh, be serving up some meat with the potatoes in this discussion. And you can see that I have the uh, main task, periodic task, broken up into roughly 11 individual programs, each which have a structure for their routines. And I have a specific structure that I stick to in all programs so they all have the same look and feel. <clears throat> and we will discuss uh, all of these programs. The first one and the last one you should already be familiar with, buffering inputs and buffering outputs. Because the, we'll call it the 5000 uh, platform, con control logics, compact logics, etc. Because of its asynchronous nature, meaning that the I.O. is updated asynchronous to the program scan. So uh, I think I said periodic task, I meant continuous task. If you look next to main task, you see that clockwise swirly. That means that it is a continuous task and you can only have one continuous task in this platform. How could you have two if they're continuous? They, you would have to have two processors running simultaneously. Now you can do that, especially with control logics. You can have two processors in the same chassis, run, each running something separate but working together to a common end. In this case, we have one task, it's a continuous task, and inside that continuous task we have a number of programs. The first one is buffer inputs. That's because we want to take a snapshot of the inputs and then move the values into another set of tags that we know won't change for the whole program scan. Because the I.O. updates asynchronous, then halfway through a program or a series of programs, the I.O. can update on its own because those I.O. modules they update the memory in the controller and the processor on a, a periodic task, a periodic re what requested um, update interval. The I.O. modules update the processor's memory with an RPI, requested packet interval. So if you got it set for 20 milliseconds, then every 20 milliseconds, the input module, the 16N, they're blue on this, the state of those 16 inputs updates the memory every 20 milliseconds regardless of where the program's at in its scan. We don't want that, so we buffer the inputs. In other words, we move the inputs to a different tag, and we know that those tag values can't change until we've completed all the programs and we're back to buffer inputs again. As we're making conclusions in our logic all the way through these programs, we are setting, resetting, or uh, changing the state of bits and memory that are going to control outputs. And we do that when we buffer outputs, we then transfer those bits to the actual module bits during the buffer outputs program. So that's at the beginning, buffer inputs, at the end, buffer outputs. That's enough for that. Now this is a uh, embedded I.O. controller, so you can see that... Um, You can see that you have embedded discrete I.O., analog I.O., and counters. That's the high-speed counter. So this is embedded electronics. So the embedded discrete I.O. is right here. Those 16 LEDs rep represent the state of those inputs in the blue there. So this is your 16N, 
16 out, and then you have the high speed counter on the top half, and then the analog in the bottom, bottom half over here. So all of those I.O. are represented here as if they were actual I.O. cars, because this really is an I.Q. 16 and an O.B. 16 and an H.S.C. and a uh, I.F. 4 O.F. 2 module. So it's the exact same electronics as if you had the individual modules. It's just embedded into one plastic package. Then when you look down below there, you'll also see that on Ethernet, <clears throat> we have two SMD E2, E2 type stepper motors. These are integrated stepper motors from AMCI and they are connected by Ethernet. And then we have a 16 input armor block that we're gathering up inputs with. And we have a, an SMC uh, EX600 SEN3 and it's going to have some I.O. blocks on it plus it's got solenoid valves which represents outputs and then we've got our CR30 safety relay we've got our PowerFlex 525 BFD and we have three robots three scare robots and all of these communicate with a processor by way of Ethernet now this is the processor right here. So notice that you see the zero there at the beginning. That's because it's slot zero. Notice down here there's no zero in front of this. This is an L2070RM, L2070RM. This is a graphic placeholder. It's there just to show you that it is connected to Ethernet. But it's not connected here. It's connected to Ethernet from here to here by way of the bus. So here's your processor, slot zero, connects into the bus, and also off the bus, you have Ethernet, and then the Ethernet connects to these devices. So this is not the device right here. That is a graphical placeholder to remind you that there is an L27 ERM connected to Ethernet, but it's connected up here. Okay, the 1732E armor block. <clears throat> this is what we're using. It's an IB16M12DR. Now the E is for Ethernet because this could be a D for device net. And this, these armor block come in a lot of varieties. And the IO connectors are M12. I prefer the M12. They're a little larger and I think easier to work with. Daisy chain support for auxiliary power? No. So if you look down at the bottom on this armor block you see one connector with the yellow plastic and the four pins. That is your power connection to power the block and power any devices that are involved with this block. But you can't daisy chain it. You can buy these in a form where you have two of those connectors so you can daisy chain them. I didn't because on this project this is the terminal for that power, meaning that the power lands here and it goes no further. But it does come from someplace else that may also be daisy chained. And then if you look up at the top, you see two Ethernet IP ports. So you can daisy chain your Ethernet. You see under dual port support, it says two Ethernet IP ports with a one for a note configured as embedded switch support star tree linear and ring topologies. Now, notice that each of these I.O. ports has two numbers associated with it, input 0, input 1, and you have LEDs to see the state. And then the next one down, it says I2 and then I3, I4, I5, I6, I7, which means each of these connectors, and they're five pin connectors, have external connections to two inputs which means that you have to use a Y cable or a splitter or you have to use the field wireable connectors and you actually wire in two inputs into each connector that attaches to this armor block. If we have time later on 
I will also discuss this armor block. This is one that I own that I use in my project, my labs here, in in projects, and it's a 16 point configurable. So that means you can configure these I/O points for inputs or outputs, or a combination thereof. And I see the picture I have doesn't match the part number that I'm using. I just noticed that. Don't worry about it. It looks the same. It's just the markings aren't exactly the same. <clears throat> Time permitting, that we will discuss this one that has 16 configurable uh, ports. We will also be using an EX600 SEN3 SMC. Um, it's really a valve body manifold but it has an Ethernet port on it. So if you look over at the far right, you'll see some solenoid valves, and then right next to it, going to the left, SI unit. If you read that close, it says Ethernet IP. So this is an Ethernet IP port to whatever is connected into this assembly. And then we're going to have uh, two DXP input blocks and one DYPB output block. So two DXPDs and one DYPB. So we're actually going to be connecting inputs and outputs to this just as if it were remote I.O. or a 1732 armor block. And then we got a panel view plus 700 and now we come to talking about the stepper motors. Now, I own five of these. I own three of the one on top, SMD17E2. I own one of the 23E2 and 134E2. In this project, we're not using any 17s. We're using a 23E2 and a 34E2. And these... Uh, E2 technology, it's a stepper motor, it's a stepper controller, fully programmable, and a stepper drive. So by way of Ethernet, the stepper controller receives information from the compact logics. And then by way of the stepper drive, it drives the stepper motor. Now you can order these with or without encoders. And if you order an encoder, you can get incremental or absolute. And now this is a 17, and you can see the connectors are a little bit different. Notice that there's one kind of in the middle of the back end of it, and then one towards the top. So one is for Ethernet, and the other is for the power connection and I.O. Now my 17s, my 17E2s, have two Ethernet ports and then one power and I.O. port. And if you're going to use these, you have to pay attention to the cabling. That blue cable or turquoise, notice one end it would plug into the stepper driver controller and the other end has a standard RJ45 connector on it for Ethernet. The other gray cable is a power and I.O. cable and they don't show another end because it's probably flying leads. Okay, let's look at the part number for these steppers. <clears throat> and remember, we're talking about designing, doing the electrical design. And the electrical design, the electrical design includes specking out these stepper motors. Now, when I took on this project, it already had two stepper motors. And so I knew what the uh, torque ratings were, the holding torque. I simply had to come up with part numbers for AMCI because I wanted to connect these by way of a premier integration to the compact logics, meaning that I can download add on profiles and uh, user defined instructions. To use with these stepper motors, you couldn't do it with those other stepper motors. 
that had already been selected. So when you look at the part number up there and how to specify a part number, what's in black is a given. It's an SMD, but you have to pick the size, 17, 23, 24, 34. And they're all E2. Then you have to pick the holding torque. In this case, we wanted 80 um, ounce inch. And then A is for the type of encoder. E is an incremental encoder. A is an absolute. And if you leave it blank, then no encoder. And then connectors. And I picked M12. And that is your only choice with this variety of uh, stepper motors from AMCI. I had no IP rating, no gearbox, no gearbox configuration, no ratio or type. So it makes for a pretty short part number, and that's all there is to it. The 17, remember, that's the size of the motor physically, and that's a standard faceplate on that motor to mount to something. 17, 23, 24, 34. And then the holding torque, whether or not you have an encoder and type of encoder, that's all you can pick from this type of stepper motor package. And then the 23, notice that's the size, 240 uh, ounce inches torque. And this is an incremental encoder instead of an absolute. And then the 34 does not have an encoder. Now, these are what I own. But what we're actually using on the project are absolute encoders. So I showed you three part numbers here. I own three of these. I own one of these and we're going to use one on the project but it's got an A for absolute encoder and we're going to use one of these and it's actually 1100 ounce inches of torque and there's an A after for absolute encoder. So as the engineer doing the electrical design you have to be, uh, you're the one that's responsible to pick the size and the holding torque and the interface and whether or not it has an encoder. We're also using a Parflex 525 variable frequency drive. These are real straightforward. Uh, they program real easy and they have premier integration with Compact Logics. So with RS Logix 5000, Studio 5000, Logic Designer. All you have to do is go add one of these into your I.O. tree, because they're on Ethernet, and it creates an instance of the class of objects called Pyroflex 525. A class of objects would be like dog. An instance of the class of objects dog would be German Shepherd, Poodle, Chihuahua. So this is an instance of a class of objects called Pyroflex 525 because these come in a variety of sizes with different input voltages, different outputs, and can support different levels of horsepower. We're also using this 440C CR30. And if you are familiar with Micro 800s, this is a Micro 830 in red plastic but it's not 100% identical. You notice that we have an Ethernet module as a plug-in module. As far as I can tell, the LC30 Micro 800 does not support using this plug-in Ethernet module. The L30 does not have Ethernet. It has what you see on the front there. It has that RS-232 round DIN connector and it has USB. I did go and look to see if I could add that module to an LC30 in CCW, Connected Components Workbench. Couldn't do it, so I'm assuming it doesn't support it. We want Ethernet. We want communication between this CR30 and our Compact Logics through Ethernet. As a matter of fact, although you're probably going to initially program a CR30 with CCW, you can program it in Studio 5000 or Logics Designer. So you need the Ethernet access. And then 
in the second plug-in slot, we put an I.O. module, a 2080IQ4 OB4. That's basically four in and four out. And these four inputs and four outputs come under the control of this CR30 as a safety device. So you can use those four inputs and four outputs to expand the capabilities of this CR30. Now, in my case, I needed a lot of these safety inputs and outputs because of the three robots. Each robot has two inputs for two channels of emergency stop, and it has two channels or two inputs in the interface for fence control. And what this company means by fence control is if you want to open the gate to go inside of the robot motion area, you can disable the robot by interrupting the fence. And that's not an e-stop. E-stops are to be avoided at all cost, simply because if you cause an e-stop with one of these robots, it screeches to a halt at that instant, and whatever it was doing is gone. There's no recovery. You might jog it back to some place, drop off a part, pick up a part, or do something, but you've lost it. So you definitely want to use the fence control anytime you want to enter that fence or that safety gate, safety cage, and you want to do it under a controlled situation. Basically, what that means is that you're going to push a button that tells the entire cell that you want to enter into that uh, gated area. And then everything's going to go to the completion of whatever it's doing, and it's going to all stop at a safe state. And then when you open up the gate, you know, the fence, you're not going into an e-stop. When you close the gate, then you can hit a button and restart it, and it'll continue right from where it left off. So we needed quite a few safety inputs and outputs, and I think I only ended up using one of the inputs uh, maybe I used an output too. We'll see. Remember, I'm in the process of designing this. I have not finished this project. And then there's two types of safety, if you want to call them contactors or contact relays. There's the kind that I have behind me that hooked up to my personal copy of a CR30. And they are actually uh, high current contactors that have another set of safety contacts. The thing is, they are all force-guided contacts, meaning that none of the contacts can move unless they all move. So if, you've had, if you have one that's welded in a position, you cannot change the position of any of the others. So that's what gives you your two-channel capability in your safety circuit. So we're using a whole handful of these little red ice cube relays. So I think we've got about six of these. Here's an image off of the uh, manufacturer's site for some of these scare robots and a rotary index table. Now there's four of them here. The project I'm doing has three. You can see what they're doing. They are assembling batteries. Battery is two or more. Those little green things with a shiny spot on the end, that is a cell. That is a dry cell. If you connect two of them together in series or in parallel, now you have a battery. Technically, those gray plastic forms, you're going to insert, let's see, one, two, three, four times six, 24 of these cells to make a battery. That's all it's doing. So you can see the first robot pulls the uh, case, if you like, off of the conveyor and sets it onto the rotary index table in front of it. Then when the table indexes, the next robot, rotating around counterclockwise, it's going to pick up cells six at a time and place them in those little plastic holders. So that means it's going to pick up four sets of six to fill up that form. Then the table will rotate, and I'm guessing that the third robot is making the connection on the top. So if these are all in parallel, then it has to connect all of those ends with one conductor. Or if they're in series, then it's going to connect them in pairs. 
somehow I don't think so because these cells, I don't see different ends pointing up. In other words, they're all the same polarity. I, I really don't know what that third robot is doing other than it's doing something because you can see that it's already done one set and now it's on the second set. Then the table indexes again and then the fourth robot picks up the other half of the plastic structure, places it on top of those 24 cells, and it looks like it may make some individual connections. I think it's screwing down screws that hold it together. I don't see where the screws are coming from. I don't see a tube feeder to that screwdriver. So I think this is just kind of a rough illustration of four of these Scara robots doing something. And then the fourth robot also picks up that battery of cells and sets it on the takeaway conveyor, the one on the bottom left. So the bottom right, plastic comes in. Upper left, plastic comes in and the batteries are in a tray in the upper right. This is kind of what this project is doing except it's not batteries and the robots have grippers. So the end of arm tooling, E-O-A-T, end of arm tooling, for all three of our robots will have grippers. Uh, one of them has two grippers, so it actually picks up two different things. Actually, two of them have double grippers. So we actually have five end of arm tooling with three robots. This little application here, which is missing some details, there would be more than one end of arm tooling on some of those robots because I don't see end of arm tooling on number four there that would allow it to pick up that finished battery and place it on the takeaway conveyor. This particular type of robot has four axes. J1, 2, and 3 are the major axes, so to speak. J1, we'll call that the shoulder. J2 would be the elbow. And J3, I don't know if you want to call that the arm or what. The scare robots aren't like the other type of robots. But J3 uh, runs that vertical rod up and down. And then J4 rotates it. So there's only four axes to control on this robot. This is the smaller of the, this series of robots. We're using the next size larger. And this is the controller though. That's what I wanted to show you. Look at all the connectors on the back of this controller. Now obviously one of them is Ethernet, which we're using. And then you've got a round connector, which we're not using. And then the next one is a long connector. That's the JRM18. That is a 69 pin it might be 68. The breakout board has 69 connections, but I'm thinking that that connector has 68 actual connections to make. And then you've got some more connectors. And then you've got a round one. That's for your pendant. And then you've got a big connector with a clamp on it. That has a cable that goes over to the robot. So this controller connects to that robot by that large connector that you can see a C1 behind the handle. Then you've got a power switch, and then you've got a power cord. So that SR31A, that is your 240, 480, whatever voltage you got input to this controller. Now the connector that I'm most interested in is the long, thin one that's number five from the far left. It's right next to the connector that looks like it has a gold or a yellow center, JRM18. The controller comes with a dummy plug. It comes with a plug that plugs in there, but it doesn't go anywhere. Inside the case, there are jumpers that jump between certain pins. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to run this robot. So if you hook up the pendant and you have that dummy plug in there, you can jog, you can play with the robot. If you pull that connector out, it removes the jumpers for e-stop and for the fence, amongst other things. The primary focus of our electrical design that we're going to discuss will be for that JRM18, that long horizontal connector, the fifth from the left. Uh, we won't discuss much else to do with the controller because we're talking just the electrical design and not the programming.
We may or may not do the robot programming, but there's plenty of excellent videos on YouTube for programming those SCARA robots. The breakout board I was talking about, that's that JRM. So that's that long, thin, horizontal connector, fifth from the left. That has a cable that goes to this breakout board. And notice at the top of it, there's a matching connector that comes off that robot. And this has 69 terminals. I only think 68 are used, but it really doesn't matter. This is where we connect our electrical interface to this robot for control purposes. Now, another thing that you can get with this uh, control, this R30 control that goes with the scare robots, you can get an operator's panel. It's a small panel that has an e-stop, has a key switch for setting the mode, got a, a couple other interface switches, but it's just switches and lights. There's no active components in it. You don't need that. But if you don't have it, then you're going to have to integrate some interface from your controller, L27ERM, I.O. You're going to have to interface some of that to some of the circuits in this box in order to allow motion. We also have a epoxy dispense machine something like this. This isn't the exact one, it's close. But it has a LC30 in it, but it does not have Ethernet. I cannot communicate with this device, this machine, through Ethernet. I'm going to have to do it through discrete I.O. could always uh, pull the LC30 out and pull in, put in an LC20, which has the same basic footprint. In other words, it'll fit. However, um, for the cost, I don't know if it's worth it because this system basically mixes two parts epoxy and then uh, pumps it through a hose over to the table to one of the nests to pot or to uh, fill up a cavity with electronics with epoxy. So we're going to control this process from our L27 ERM. And that's the lineup for this project. Not functionality, just the hardware. Well, that's enough for one setting. Um, I don't know how often I'm going to be able to record uh, these discussions. I'm going to try to do at least one a week. This one was almost 50 minutes, a little long. But as I told you in the beginning, that if your attention span is short, then you're not going to be able to do this kind of work anyway because this type of work takes extreme concentration and there's a reason that it pays as well as it does. Right now, the rate, this is the summer of 2021, and right now the typical rate for, we'll just say PLC programmer or controls engineer is somewhere between 40 and $60 an hour. And typically, um, it's going to be more than 50 and there's some that are getting 65 70 80 dollars an hour a lot of it has to do with whether you're a contract or a direct hire if you're a direct hire you're getting a salary probably 100 to 120 so you don't get the big money for doing nothing so if you don't have the time invested the uh, fortitude and the focus you're not going to do it anyway so there's a lot of boring segments in doing this kind of work where you are rooting your way through manuals trying to find that one little tidbit that's going to answer your question. And a lot of these manufacturers, their manuals are pathetic. The information's there, but you got to wonder if they were thinking about who was going to access it when they were organizing the information. And these are all good companies. I mean, there's no one company that has it all covered and you have to be able to work with all of them. So we're going to continue this project again later. I'm not a hundred percent sure where I'll start, but I will definitely get into the electrical design first. Typically a controls engineer, if he's going to do the programming, 
would like to have a finished set of prints before they start doing the programming. Two reasons. One, it's easier to figure out what the I.O. is and to nail down the sequence or the uh, functional spec, as they call it, funky spec, functional spec. And also, less is going to change. Now, in my case, I started doing some of the programming right along with the electrical design. Unfortunately, I had to do a few things over. But it was still shorten the calendar length because although I had to do some, some things over, I still got it done quicker because while I was waiting for information for the electrical design, you know, from vendors, I could be working on the program because I knew some of the programming wouldn't change. So I think what we're going to do in the next series, we're going to start the electrical design and maybe introduce some of the architecture for the programming. Because remember, you need to nail down the sequence in writing before you start programming it. Well, thank you for watching, and I hope you learned something useful. Have a good day.